Yes. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now that we got all the, the emails. Yeah, we didn't get that on the record, evidently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, do, yeah, do you want to say it again, John, just so it's on the recording? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I said for the record that Lottie could probably outbench Ian Swire. So there you go. There, go. there it is. There it There'll is. be thousands that will watch this later. Yeah, we got it on the record. Yeah. Hey, Steve, good to see you. Hey, good to be here. Good to see you, too. How you been? Good, good. Thanks yep. for joining us today. Yep. Good to be around. Yeah. Well, Mike, do you want to go ahead and get started? Sure. We may have a few more people. I don't know. Mike, you've, you've got the uh, list of who's accepted, so I don't know who else is coming on, but we probably can go ahead and uh, get started. I know uh, quite a few people today were banking on the recording um, because we have a few people out on um vacations and stuff so uh hopefully our discussion today will be helpful for them uh listening to it back especially the bench pressing uh you know the the standards there that we're, we're setting so um if you don't already and i think most of you do except den maybe den do you mind just uh putting your name in the in your zoom box just so everyone knows who you are i think a lot of people do know you but uh, just so we can keep that up. Um, today, we do have a special guest with us. John West is with us today. And uh, we're going to get into the meat of our discussion uh, later where we're going to interview him and, and talk a little bit about some of the opportunities post Pentecost Sunday. Um, but before we do that, um, I do want to have Mike just share a little bit about his trip to Africa. Uh, he's one of the only people I know who have traveled to multiple countries recently. And uh, as many of you may remember, if you're on the call last month, uh, Mike was actually in Africa during that time. So Mike, do you just want to give a quick update on your, your travels and what that all entailed? Yeah. So um, myself, along with Henry Smith, who's a past president at IWU, and um, a longtime partner of educated, uh, education around the world, a guy named Kent Peterson. The three of us uh, traveled to uh, Eswatini, which is formerly Swaziland, uh, as well as Mozambique and Zambia to visit our uh, Westland Bible colleges there. And so uh, Henry, uh, he's given a part of his time at IWU because he's still a teacher there to to help the global church uh, with education uh, initiatives. And so, um, sorry, there's like construction in the background. Hopefully that it's not loud or something. I hear back vacuum, but um, yeah. So he, he was consulting with the schools on the various goals that they had. A big one at our, our schools in Africa is accreditation. That's becoming more and more important for, uh, for just the, um, the draw for students to attend the schools knowing that they are getting a diploma that's accredited where they can continue education and build upon it. Um, that wasn't always the case as far as it being um, something that was really necessary, but it's becoming that much so. And so there's a lot of requirements for the schools to kind of innovate and, and uh, become more current with their, uh, their systems and in the school and all that. And so um, I was there as a part of Amplified Leaders, uh, which is our initiative to help pastors receive training uh, where it's uh, low access or um, resources. And then um, Kent Peterson, has, uh, he's done a lot of work projects. He's a construction guy and he's helped at various Bible schools and um, really supported a lot of students. And so um, we visited with the 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 people there, I took videos of some of our Amplified Leaders grant recipients, which is kind of cool because a number of them are actually teachers at the Bible school. So we're kind of investing in that trainer, those to, who are then passing on that training. And it was so encouraging to meet uh, with the, the, the faculty at the schools. So EWBC is in Swaziland and uh, it's just a wonderful place. And I kind of learned more about their heritage in that uh, even while I was in Mozambique or Zambia, individuals in those other countries, some of them have studied at EWBC in Swaziland 
now as Fatini. So it's kind of cool to see how they're connected. Um, but also, um, I get to now kind of tell more stories and help promote what's going on over there. And so I'll do that through some video work that I'm going to put out, as well as um, we've got a dream to have a website uh, or like a page on our site that has sub pages for every Bible school where we can get a glimpse at how many students they have, how many faculty, what's their annual budget, maybe their need, and, and then some visual support so people can envision those places. A number of people, I, I know, um, you know, I think Dan and Steve Matthews and, um, and others have been a part of investing in Shy Shy in Mozambique. Uh, there's been a lot of partnerships there and it, it really shows. The, there's a vibrant uh, student body. There was a good number of students on campus, still some online in a creative online way. But um, it was, they're just some really sharp um, young men and women and uh, just a really great spirit there at the school. And then in Zambia, they're working to get, um, they wanna become a university and not just a university in Zambia, but maybe they're talking about it being the Africa Westland University. So more of a whole area where if they can receive accreditation as a university, then they can help uh, launch leaders even into uh, just uh, higher levels of education and training. So we did have some trouble at the Mozambique border. I'll just tell you, we got turned down and we kind of got tracked down by the border security. <laughs> we went to a different border the second day and uh, we got like a hotel reservation. The, there's a guy who wouldn't let us in the first border with our letter of invitation for the school. And he, um, he actually called the other border, got our information, called the hotel to see if we checked in there, which we hadn't and uh, called the school. So we, Philip, Philippe at uh, Shy Shy, he, he was praying for us. He said, I didn't want to worry you, but I got a call from the border security agent. So we were nervous we weren't going to get out of the country. We took five COVID tests throughout that time. And it, a lot of what we deal with, they deal with, they were wearing masks in the church services or chapels. They were distanced their seats. And so the things that we experience, it's really everywhere around the world. So I uh, appreciate, yeah, your guys is uh, just this team of mission leaders and the work you do, because I got to see some firsthand additional places where the Wesleyan churches come together to help equip and partner and learn from and help in these various mission contexts. So way to go. And uh, hopefully I didn't go on too long there, but it was a great time. And I think we're opening up it. There's hope for travel again and being present in relationships with others. Thanks again. That's great. Thanks, Mike. And, um, and that what Mike has done with the Amplified Leaders Project has just been amazing the last three years. So it's been really cool to have him you know, be involved in that. And I know some of you on this call have, been, have helped and, and helped see some of those leaders get developed through that. So thanks a lot. Um, just real quick, just as a way of a reminder um, and kind of reminding why we're gathering together as we kind of set all this up today is the purpose of us gathering as mission leaders um, is really just to connect and collaborate so that we can better engage churches and districts in the global mission. And today, our discussion is going to center around um, how to help discer discern God's call to mission. Um, and, and we're going to have uh, John share a little bit uh, just in some of the practical ways that we can not only, uh, you know, help um, maybe those that we work with, you know, who are discerning different things that God's leading them into in their life, but people who come into our churches and come across our path, how do we help them discern where God's leading them? and steward their call well. Um, and so to prime the pump a little bit, this will be a lot of our discussion today will be more kind of just listening and presentation of listening to John, but to prime the pump, we're gonna just break out into groups for a few minutes and just share a little bit about your own personal calling. Like how did God call you? Maybe some of the ways that he put people in your life or um, some life events came about that kind of awakened you to what God was leading you into, uh, into ministry or um, different uh, phases of your life, uh, you know, different chapters of your ministry. Uh, so we're going to have Taylor just break us into groups for a few minutes and share that. And then we'll come back and hear more from John.
All right. I think we're all back here. Um, hope that went well. Hope you all got a chance to share a little bit. Um, I'm going to kick it over to James now, and he's going to kind of facilitate our discussion with John today about how to discern God's call. So James, take it away. Awesome. Well, thanks. I'm excited to have everybody here today. And um, so we want to talk about this and specifically um, something called Live Scent that we've been working on develop. So before we jump into that and, and, um, and you know, bring John in just to get a little bit of history of kind of how that came about and why that came about. Um, and so part of the, the mobilization journey that we've been on with Global Partners with Missionaries is we did a survey. We're like, what are some of the barriers that you face you know, for, for next gen young people and some of the ones even in our own field, like what were barriers that you faced? And the number one thing that came back wasn't actually the financial piece, raising money, which it was up there, but it wasn't number one. I thought it would be, it was the number one was if I was sure of God's call, then I would say yes. And I would, we were like, whoa, okay, that's, that's something. And so we started thinking that through a little bit and, and, and wanting to know, you know, explore that a little bit. And at the same time, um, Dave Drury, who's the chief of staff here at headquarters, was taking on more mobilization in his role related to, you know, not just missionaries, but also church planners and ministers and all that. And uh, he, he said a statement the other day, and, I, and if I get it wrong, John, correct me there, but I think he said, the Wesleyan Church does a great job when someone says, um, I'm called to this. They're called to missions, you know, GP runs through, they're called to church planning, we've got something for them. They're called, we do that well. But from the point of, I'm not sure what God's calling me up to, yes, I'm called to this, we don't have a whole lot for them anymore. Um, we, we talked a lot about, we used to have those camp meetings, you know, and we, people get called out to go into the ministry and all that. We don't do that a lot. I mean, some places may still, but, but those kind of things just don't happen much. And there's just not a lot of that where we're really calling people out to say, what are you going to be? I mean, we're all called, you know, to live sent. We're all called to be disciples, but we also, there's specific callings in that. And so Dave and I started talking a little bit about that. Um, and then Ed Love got involved with church planning, multiplication division, or the, um, the CMAD, their department. We started having this dialogue um, about what we could do to develop this thing called Live Scent. And at that point, somewhere, uh, Dave brought in John West, which I don't know if everyone's familiar with John, but John used to be on staff here at Trinity Wesleyan Church in Indiana, and then left and started his um, own, is it 501c3? Or no? Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, grounds well where they focus on discipleship disciple making and, and developing and I'll let him talk a little more about that but then he came into the conversation because of his experience in this as well so I'll turn over to you John just to kind of finish up that the why uh, of we, we're doing what we're doing yeah hey great to see all of you uh, I know a few of you but uh, those that I don't uh, good to meet you so James said I really my background's in church planning uh, we planted two churches in one in Dallas, one in Des Moines. And about five years ago, I had a uh, almost just a epiphany, maybe, in ministry that I had gone for 10 or 12 years planting churches where the whole emphasis was on how do we reach people and gather, get people saved and baptized and basically grow, which all sounds really good and it all, all is really good. But that Great Commission go and make disciples piece I kind of left out and um, I would have said we were discipling people well but the fact is um, it seemed like as soon as people came out of baptism we were looking who was that next person we can you know reach with the gospel and and as a result uh, a long story but the bottom line is I was out for a walk with God during a sabbatical and kind of a ministry transition period and he just said John the great commission is not to plant churches uh, the great commission is not to grow churches the great commission is to go and make disciples and you know you can plant churches and grow churches and build ministry around everything but making disciples and Unfortunately, that's just the case. So that planted a seed in my heart of beginning to look at the congregation I was leading a little bit less as sheep to be shepherded or that consumer mentality we sometimes have. You know, what can we offer to keep people, to draw people? And I began to see people more as like an army to be mobilized for ministry that all of us have a call to make disciples, that that's not just my call, it's everyone's. And so, yeah, in 2020, uh, we 
much groundswell, as James said, and the whole purpose of the ministry is to try to come alongside uh, pastors, ministry leaders, and really help them see their congregations as a, as a group of people to be mobilized as masterpieces, really, in the eyes of God. Sometimes I think, and I know I've been there as a pastor, it's like you see slots to fill, volunteers to plug in it becomes kind of this mechanical process and uh really helping pastors see congregations know you have an army of like disciple makers pioneers planters missionaries like the potential and having that abundance mentality instead of a scarcity mentality so so we started and three months later covid hit uh but you know we had a little bit of a ramp a ramp up moving into that and in the process connected with a lot of districts, a lot of different um, leaders, a lot of pastors. And in about the last 12 to 18 months, we've been able to train close to 400 pastors across a number of denominations. Um, and I have a conviction, I guess, in my heart, just kind of getting back to the why. Um, a couple of you are from Canada, but uh, I guess you do have do you have a baseball team in Canada anymore? Okay. Yeah, you, I guess you do. Um, but in, in baseball, you got this sort of farm team system versus free agency and other sports are like that too. And I think a lot of times when we're thinking about the global mission, we often think about recruiting free agents, or we think about bringing a missionary in or connecting with someone that has a call out there rather than the farm team mentality of developing and raising up our own. And I think that's true with just about anything. Most of my experience has been with church planning, and that's definitely the case in that world too. As soon as a pastor or leader has a, we want to be ascending church, we want to plant. So where are all the church planners? You know, where are they at? Like they're in a, in a warehouse somewhere and just waiting to be called upon. And it's just not like that. We have to grow them up. We have to raise them up. Uh, I talked to, I think Den was there at, at mid-year last year in Canada. And I was talking about like this grocery store mentality that we have where we go to the grocery store, we expect there to be fruit and we pick the fruit and we take it home and we consume it. And the, the fact of the matter is if everybody did that and only consumed and grabbed the low hanging fruit, eventually there would be no more fruit. Somebody has to plant trees. <laughs> Somebody has to grow oranges. Someone has to be cultivating this fruit. And I know we don't always see that, but look even at your churches. And even as we look, you know, nationally and ask yourself, where did that fruit come from? Like, did I raise that fruit up? Or am I the recipient of someone else doing all the planting and watering? Like, are we cultivating future ministers, planters, missionaries? That's kind of on us. And so I, I just feel like through Groundswell, our primary job is to help mobilize the church and help to see the people we have with fresh eyes. So uh, Ed and I launched something called Project 72, uh, this was back last, end of last summer, and that wrapped up in January. And we really just connected about 30 churches and said, hey, we want to start an R&D project to try to identify 72, uh, we call them pioneer leaders, but lay leaders that feel called to ministry and are actually serving. And we just want to learn from them. We want to do research would like to train, develop. And the fruit of that was 80%. There's a lot of things I could share, but 80% of the people that went through that said they would love to have ongoing training for ministry. And, and about half of the people that went through it said, I know my pastor sent me here. They think I'm a pioneering leader, but I really don't know what God's called me to. I just have a lot of ambition and drive and I'm going to serve the Lord. Um, so when James talks about, you know, him and Dave and Ed, and then me coming into this, really it's with this spirit of saying, we need to create an opportunity for people to connect in, to learn how to discern God's calling. We believe we have congregations full of 
of masterpieces, creations, Ephesians 2.10, you know, God has created you uh, to be a masterpiece, prepared you for good works in advance. Um, so Live Scent, essentially the why behind it is what would happen if we offered an opportunity for pastors and leaders to be able to send people that they feel like, man, God has his hand on this person. God's stirring that person's heart. God's calling them to something more. I don't know what it is, but boy, it would be great if there was a process they could go through to learn more about that. Uh, that's kind of the why behind it. Uh, so we're praying to see, yeah, great, just a great, great fruit from it. Great. Can you just real quick in a nutshell, then to tell us what is live sent, describe it real, you know, in the, in the components of it. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so basically, uh, it's a, it's a partnership collaborative effort between global partners and CMAD. The vision is to recruit 120 plus uh, participants. They will go through six sessions of Zoom call training along with an online platform we use called Pathright that's gonna help people discern different callings God has given throughout scripture. So. There is a calling, for example, from above, and it's a calling to go and make disciples. There's a calling that comes outside of us where we look at the need around the world and we see, you know, just see the incredible gap, the gospel gap Wayne often talks about between what could be and what is. So there's an, a calling from outside, like the man from Macedonia, you know, that says, hey, come to Macedonia, <laughs> come to Africa, come to Sw Swaziland, wherever, you know, come. There's an outside calling, but then there's also an inside calling. There's a calling from within where the Holy Spirit speaks and he says things to us that we have to be in the right frame of mind to hear. And I think a lot of times, you know, I look at my own calling. It was definitely a calling from within where I just felt God's spirit saying something to me that really didn't make a lot of sense. It wasn't really that outside or calling from above. It was this internal. So we help people learn how to hear from the spirit. Uh, there's a calling that's sort of this calling from below or for beyond, beyond the grave, so to speak. It's, a, it's an eternal calling, like eternal destinies are at stake. And so we have kind of a, a calling uh, beyond us and beyond this world that says, who can we reach with the gospel? So we're going to, we're going to unpack a number of the callings that God has for us in scripture. And it's really a process whereby participants are beginning to slowly narrow their calling over six sessions. Um, Groundswell has done a lot of the kind of back end, helping with the curriculum with James and Ed, uh, helping train up coaches, helping train kind of the leaders that will facilitate these cohorts. And ultimately they'll be doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching with participants. There'll be a discernment process in the round table. And the end of the six sessions, participants will basically have one of four next steps. So if they feel called to global missions or to serve overseas, there'll be a next step bridge to global partners. If they feel called to plant a church domestically, then, you know, with Ed and, and church planning department, there may be a call to pioneer a new work in your church, in your community. That's not necessarily a new church plant, but it might be a fresh expression of the gospel or a pioneer project. They'll connect with Groundswell. And then if they just feel called to be an evangelist, to be a seed sower, uh, wherever they are, uh, there'll be a, a fourth place to connect on that. So um, that's the general concept behind it. And uh, through, through a lot of uh, donors and support and scholarships, we're able to offer this thing absolutely free, which is kind of crazy to me. Um, but that's a, yeah, huge, huge perk uh, for sure. Yeah. So when you think about this, um, John, like the whole idea of, yeah, we want to get people in to explore their calling. And our hope is at the end, people are going to follow one of these tracks and, you know, be courageous enough to follow that. But what, like the ideal person, like who is this for? Like um, who is the, the, we, you know, this is the person we want to try to get to this thing or, or pastors would want to say, hey, go to this. 
Yeah, I, I would say as you're looking at people in your congregation, uh, you know, the way that I phrase it is, um, and the way we phrase it with a lot of participants, like if you feel like God has made you for more than you're currently experiencing, or I've said things like, you know, if you feel like God might be stirring you in this season to make a change, you know, COVID has been kind of this crazy season. There's been a lot of disruption for sure, but I think it's caused a lot of people to kind of look at their day-to-day -day life, look at the disruption, what matters most, think about their families, think about God's calling. They've had a lot of time to process. <laughs> um, I just think it's a strategic window of time for us to kind of reassess our congregation and say, you know, as many of you are, are leading outreach efforts or mission pastors or whatever it might be, just to look at your, your body and say, man, I feel like this person, God is stirring their heart or I see something in them. You know, sometimes you hear people talk about an I see in you conversation. Like if I could even say it, and hopefully this is cool to say, but like even prophetically a little bit, like when I, when you look at someone and prophetically, you feel like God has given you a word, like, man, God has a calling on their life. I have to remind myself to do that more often. Like I see people around me and I'll think to myself, man, that person is made for more. Like God has something for them, but I don't always say it. And I think I've just had to remind myself to say it more often. Like, Hey, you know, I don't know if this is from God, but I just, every time I see you, I feel like God has something more for you. And that would be the type of person you would invite into something like this. And it'd be a great next step to say, you know, hey, I see, I just feel like God's doing something new in your life. I think there's more he wants to do in your life. And there's this opportunity called Live Sent. I'd love to invite you to be a part of it and to get them um, to sign up. And I'll put a link in the chat window here in a minute on how to do that. But, but definitely that would be part of the profile. Yeah, that's great. And um, I just, you telling that story reminds me of um, our executive director, Dennis Jackson. I think everybody knows him, but he he says that often. And he tells when he was at church as a young person, you know, and, and I think it was just graduating high school. They were, and, and they were going through and congratulating whatever. And somebody in the church, an elder grabbed him by the face and looked in his eyes and said, be a pastor, you know, that very prophetic voice. And that led him on a path of ministry. And it just as a reminder to, yeah, we've got to do that. We don't do that as much. So. Um, so yeah, so uh, you know, part of this is, is John said six sessions, and and it it starts in August, but it, it's gonna it, the sessions aren't you know it's like every three weeks I think we're looking at them. Weeks, so it'll, yeah. it'll be a few months it'll take, and there's and along the way there's coaching and interaction, so people get it out of it as much as they put into it. It's very much an interactive uh, piece. But one of the questions is, so what happens once that's done? What's the thought behind what you know? What's the hope for this going forward? Yeah. Yeah, and I would say, too, uh, just kind of to back up a little bit, if you are someone that would say, uh, I think we would have 10 people or more that I would like to invite into this, uh, we do have the opportunity to kind of connect in with churches like that to do exclusive cohorts for your church. So most churches will probably send a handful of people and we'll try to coordinate schedules and get people connected. We have a lot of internationals because we launched this at the Pentecost prayer event. So we have a number of people from other countries connecting in and, and James is going to help facilitate uh, Darla, who's a missionary in India and her husband have a few others. But um, so if you do think you could get 10 or if you're even watching this recording <laughs> and think you can get 10, then definitely connect with me uh for sure and that link in the chat uh, will be a first step to do that um the ultimate fruit of this is to just continue to mobilize the body of christ i mean i i feel like you know my brother is serving overseas he's in the middle east uh trying to translate the gospel with an unreached people group and he was on the front lines of doing a lot of mobilization in the States through perspectives and through a lot of things he was doing around the country. Um, 
And I think it's easy to sometimes have a scarcity mindset without even meaning to, uh, especially post COVID and especially as we're trying to regather, you know what I mean? It's the body of Christ, but it's possible this could also be a scattering in a positive way if we leverage it right. It, I think we're coming out of a season, like I said, where people are, they're reevaluating a lot. Um, I think I, I see a lot of even my neighbors that are making career changes, that are moving, that are transitioning. And I think the window is right. And I think we have an opportunity and, you know, what could come of it? I'm not sure, but I do know, and you, you could share more on the global side, but at least on the church planning side in the United States and Canada, every year we bust our butt to mobilize people, right? You guys all know what this, what I'm about to say probably, but every year what doesn't matter what leaders in place doesn't matter what the new initiatives new charges whatever it might be it just it seems like every year we plant about the same number of churches and there's kind of this feeling of um like man we have to mobilize the body of christ like we have to put all our chips on the table and this is what we need to do this is what it's about and so my prayer is if we can just even just move the needle a little bit, you know, even if five to 10 new people feel a call to serve overseas, you know, five to 10 people feel a call to launch out and plant a new church. I mean, if five to 10 people feel a call to pioneer a new expression. To me, it's worth it. Like, I think it's absolutely uh, worth it. So anyway, we're putting a lot of energy behind it. And I just, I'd really encourage you to, to really think about the people in your congregations, uh, maybe even some of you that would say, man, that's something I need to go through. Uh, I need to send someone else through. Uh, I think it could be that life changing. And we all, we all can look back. We we're just talking to Den in our, in our group, fisherman, grizzly guy. We said if only he had a peg leg and an eye patch, he would look just like an old grizzled out fisherman decided to go to church one day man you 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 told this story in like 10 seconds tell it really real quick i mean seriously 10 seconds you, you did it earlier yeah sir so my best friend had gotten saved the year before and had gone to kingswood and had been working at leading me to the lord through the year i was a commercial fisherman and uh, we ended up back home for a weekend because we had no market for the fish i went to church with him got saved and god put his hand on me that night and called me to ministry Went to Bible college the next day to sign up. Hmm. I mean, and look at him now. He's like all-star Atlantic district right. rock star, yeah. pastor, planter, <laughs> you know, on boards, making decisions. But just the fact that that person connected with you, invited you, that night you were saved, called Bible college the next day, and now you've been in ministry. I don't know. How long has it been now? Forty. One well, uh, forty-two years since I get well, when I get saved. Forty-three years wow. of ministry, and who are the people in our churches like that? You know that we just look at and we say, "Man, the potential is there." I think sometimes we we oftentimes look with the physical eyes. You know, I don't know. They have to be of a certain stature and a certain amount of charisma and a certain you know profile. And I'd really encourage you just to pray through your congregations and say, Lord, who, who do you have a call on? Who is a person of peace I can go at? Who is someone that's open and receptive? And um, yeah, really recruit them. So. Yeah, that's great, John. Thanks, John. And thanks, Dan, for sharing. And just again, a reminder of the power of invitation. I wonder if we sometimes just assume that people know or hear or whatever, they'll hear it from somewhere. But that personal invitation, so many people respond to that. And, and the reality is, at least, and in, 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 I know for missionaries, at least with Global Partners and other organizations we've talked with, I know, you know, church planners as well, we're just seeing fewer and fewer numbers of people. And I personally don't believe God stopped calling. I believe he has. Um, and so we're just trying to uh, help facilitate ways for people to hear that voice and to provide people an opportunity to journey along 
to hear it, unpack it and understand it. And so, you know, it's not really a program in a sense. I mean, I guess, you know, it is, but it's more of a, a relationship and you're building that. That's why we have cohorts. That's why we have coaches. So you facilitate conversation, facilitate all of that. And, you know, again, as, as John mentioned, I want to reiterate that if churches feel like they want to do their own, we'd love that. I mean, that's great. You have your own cohorts. John has, has said, I'll be happy to train up someone to coach it and run it. And then you take it and run with it at your own schedule. So it's really, and the fact that it's a collaboration between, you know, CMAN and Global Partners, it's a, it's a Wesleyan church thing. We want to see people respond to the call. And so, well, I want to pause there. I, I, if there are any other questions from any of you guys here or anybody watching the recording, you send your questions to www.shouldhavebeentheronthatday.com. And um, just kidding. You can, send them, you can send them to Mike Morgan. I'm just kidding. We love you. I know you're busy, but uh, send it to Mike Morgan. But any questions from anybody on the call? Related to this, I would say when I was at Bethany, an old retired missionary lady by the name of Yuda Chase came over one day and put her hand on me and said, "I covet you for the mission field." <laughs> wow, that's bold. Love it. Yeah, awesome. So I went to Australia, ten minutes from the best beaches in the world, and spent four years there slaving away. <laughs> that's awesome. John, in your mind, um, do you see this primarily as a like? geared for college student adult or do you see it reaching into like students or um what's kind of the ideal and and maybe it's based off of the person but yeah and we definitely it's a general invitation for sure um uh, <clears throat> you know what i've found in my life anyway is that it seems like the longer i live the more things I have to overcome to step out. Uh, you know, you start having children, you start buying homes, you start getting invested in a career, you start, it's like these. And I think when you're younger and you're more flexible and you have more freedom, you have more opportunity ahead of you. I would say there is oftentimes more flexibility and openness to God's calling. That being said, I mean, we all know, stories and maybe some of you are testimony of when God calls us, you know, out of just kind of that normal daily life. But, uh, but I do think this is for everyone. And I do think that, you know, we will have Spanish speaking cohorts and English speaking, we haven't gotten it in any other languages yet, but those two for sure. So that's going to be great. Uh, I think that by and large, as we begin to get more people registering for this, uh, we'll try if we feel like there might be a, a sense that someone's, I don't know, more of an international flavor of cohorts. We're going to try to connect them with people that have experience on the mission field, that have experience in cross-cultural environments. Um, but, but I think overall, the hunger and openness to doing what God, God asks would be, that would probably be the biggest prerequisite in my mind. And I, I have this book, we're going to read some of this, but it's just, it's called More. And it's all about finding your personal calling. But basically he writes, how often does God laugh in response to one of the most frequent prayers he hears? God show me and I will follow. He knows that showing us the full picture all at once is the worst thing he can do. <laughs> He wants our obedience today in small steps based on what he does reveal. He calls us to be faithful with little so that he can entrust us with much. And there is this idea that God has to like just reveal this big <clears throat> giant picture in order to move us. I feel like we're looking for people that are just saying, no matter what you ask me to do, big or small, like I'll take that next step. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of people coming out of this, it will probably be a next step to investigate, to move forward. But, you know, most of my time in prayer is just getting to a place where I've surrendered to God and whatever he's going to tell me. That's like the lion's share of prayer in my mind is, is like getting myself to a place where no matter what he tells me, I will do it. Once you're there, I think it's all good. But <laughs> getting there is part of this six sessions, part of this process. So, yeah, good question. 
Any other questions? Well, um, thanks, John. Appreciate you coming and sharing this. And um, just some of the logistical things um, uh, we have. There's a there's a couple of times coming up where you're going to be doing some just informational calls about that. You want to just give that real quick, and then maybe some of the deadlines and things <clears throat> on it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so the link on the website. Uh, go ahead and click that, and you will see more um, more of this information or rated, but. Uh, the two calls we have are just initial orientations. We have one on Saturday, and that is going to be in the morning. Uh, let me pull it up here. Yeah, Saturday morning from 1030 to 1130 Eastern time. And then we have another one on Monday night. And the Monday night one, June 7th, is from 7 to 8 o'clock Eastern time. And that's just a a lot of what I just shared, you know, honestly, uh, but with a, a few more a few more details for people that might be interested. So if you know of folks that you can get onto that website to sign up, they'll get the Zoom link. They'll get everything they need if they just sign up on that on that link. So that's the basics. And then we will be recruiting through the summer. Uh, August first is going to be the deadline for new people to to get on board. And at least the way James and, and Ed and I have been kind of operating, we know that really once you get to July 1st, it's almost like, and, and maybe even now to a certain degree, people just start checking out, uh, just like they're off on vacations and whatever. So sooner the better would be, would be ideal. And if you already happen to be interested in a cohort or know a church that you think might be or whatever, I know, Dan, you represent your whole district there and, and Steve as well as DDGP. So if there are churches that you think might be interested, they would just need to contact John directly. Um, and I think we could put his email address in, in the chat there, just an interest, and he'd be happy to follow up with you on, on how to set that up as well. So we're just trying to be as flexible and easy as we can to just get as many people involved in whatever way would best serve you know them. Um, because we just think that this would be a great way to, you know, get people challenged to live it out. So cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, thanks, sir. I will turn it back over to Mike or Ian or. Whoever's going yeah. To yeah. Ahead. This has been so uh, cool to hear more, John, about this. And, um, you know, many of the things you talked about resonated with even just what our, our group shared. Charlotte or Lottie was sharing about how her daughter's call was just step after step after step. It wasn't this big revelation moment jessica shared about someone who spoke into her life and said i i have you thought about being a pastor and she's like no you know and here she is serving in ministry as a pastor so um definitely resonates and i think it also opens up our eyes to the fact just a reminder that uh wow maybe god's made it clear in our lives and we've taken those steps of faith there's a lot of people around us who, who need some courage and encouragement and, uh, and a tool like this. And, um, and even for us, I'm thinking too, like, this is something I could see over time, someone going through it and, and years later going through it again, because it's a process at that stage in your life. So thanks for sharing. And uh, we are going to send this out uh, to the, the wider network. So they'll take a look. Um, there's actually real, no major announcements here, but if you have any resources to share uh, with the wider community of mission leaders, feel free to send them to me and I'm happy to include those in a monthly email out to the group. So if you see a, a great video resource or a book or some sort of online tool or even something you've created in your own context as a resource for, um, for any type of missional engagement, uh, I'm happy to, I'd love to share that with everyone. So thanks for joining us today. And uh, let's just close in a word of prayer. And, and uh, Steve Matthews, I just ask, would you, would you say a prayer for us as we go about the rest of our day and what God would want to do with this time? Sure. Thank you, Father. We, we come before you. We thank you for your love, mercy, and kindness, the draw that you put on all of our lives to to further your kingdom into this world and to, to share your love with, with those that are far, near far, and hard places. And Father, I pray that as we go from this, that you would quicken in our mind and, and in our hearts those that, that, that we need to steer, that, that we need to direct and engage and encourage. 
that you would help us, Lord, to, to have eyes to see and, and, and ears to hear of, of those opportunities and that, that we would set before, uh, to do, set out to do your, your bidding in this world and continue to do so. Thank you for this gathering of folks and the, and, uh, and the things that, we've, that have been shared here today. Would we take them to heart and uh, quick them in our minds and move us forward uh, so that your kingdom might be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Thanks for joining us today, John. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate all, right, all of you and the work you're doing. We'll Have a you. great day. Cool. Thanks, we'll, everyone. We'll Have see a good you day. next month, John. What's that? <laughs> I said I won't see John next month. No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I might make a special appearance. We'll see what happens. Perfect. <laughs> all right. See you guys. Yeah. Go yeah. through the fishing rain route, probably. <laughs> Bye.